On August 17th, 2007, from the intimidating depths of the dark web, an ominous message appeared. The message read, I'm looking for a partner in crime. Would anyone like to work with me? Two other individuals would answer back, thus creating an underground friendship between three newly formed criminals. And moving forward, the trio plotted an elaborate and evil scheme to get rich. Their plans would target the vulnerable, and ultimately, it would cost the life of a terrified individual and leave a nation reeling in anger. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the disturbing case of Rie Isagai. Infamously known as the Dark Sight murder in Japan, this case brought many questions around the nation's death penalty, though shockingly, it barely made any international headlines. Before we begin, and just to let you know, I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Rie Isagai. Welcome back to Japan, folks. Found in the far east of Asia, this island nation is tucked away to the west of Russia, China, and Korea. It's a highly fascinating country, and with thanks to its geographical positioning, it experiences a jaw-dropping variety of seasons. We're talking several meters of snow in the north here, which greatly contrasts to its tropical paradise in the south. This case takes us near the middle of Japan's main island, Honshu. Aichi Prefecture is home to 7.5 million residents, and is often referred to as one of Japan's main manufacturing hubs. Its capital, Nagoya, is the country's fourth most populous city, and landmarks include Atsuta Shrine, a tree-lined Shinto pilgrimage site, and the restored 17th century fortress of Nagoya Castle. And, of course, talking about one of my most favorite topics, the city is famous for its Nagoya-style tebasaki, Japanese chicken wings with shatteringly crispy skin, coated in garlic, ginger, and black pepper. Now, today's video requires more explanation before we get into the story. Although many of us would have already heard of the mysterious dark web and its disturbing connotations, knowing what it actually means is very crucial here. Open any standard browser and punch in any old URL, and typically you're surfing the web. But taking it one step further, if you want to access something confidentially, such as medical records, your mail, or fee-based content like OnlyFans, fans, you have to access the deep web to find it. Which, by the way, did you know that around 98% of the internet is actually classed as the deep web? The long story short here is that if you want to access confidential things, then the URL you follow has to be both encrypted and time-based so no one else can follow it. Well, we're going even deeper than this. The dark web is a subset of the deep web that is intentionally hidden away, and furthermore requires a specific browser such as Tor to access it. Now, there are good reasons for this. One example is to hide customer and consumer data. And of course, with the intent to make something private, also comes a demand to exploit it. Which is surprisingly very easy to do. It's almost impossible to avoid the usage of the deep web and even the dark web. And with no adequate restrictive measures put in place, it is a free market for both both sleuths and criminals to operate at will. Sharing your personal data online is a lot easier than you may realize. Every time you sign up to a website or subscribe to a newsletter, it often comes with a terms of service for you to accept. And unfortunately, it is as simple as that. By accepting the site policy or terms of service, you might actually be giving consent for your data to be sold and resold by hundreds of data brokers. This is where the real problem exists. Many of these data companies hold personal information like your name, gender, online alias, shopping habits, and even your home address. Smaller consequences include spam and targeted ads. However, in the wrong hands, people with the right information and a vested interest in you could do a lot more damage. And this is where this video's sponsor comes in. Incogni. Incogni helps you protect your privacy by removing your personal data off the market. They do this by reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data to be removed, and then finally dealing with any objections. And even better, the whole process is automated. Simply sign up to Incogni with my link and use the code CRIME, create an account, and the automated system will immediately get to work for you. After signing up, Incogni was able to detect 71 data brokers with my personal information. They got straight to work requesting my data to be removed, with one request being completed within the hour. You're also able to see the type of data broker, what information they carry, and even the risk factor. Protect your online privacy today. 
Incogni is offering 60% off from the first 100 people who use my unique code CRIME below. Thank you to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. Thank you to you folks for supporting us content creators. And now let's get straight back into today's case. As I was saying, no one really knows the size of the dark web, but most estimates place it at around 5% of the entire internet, compared to 98% being the overarching deep web family, and only 2% being the typical non-restricted world wide web. Now, despite its ominous sounding name, not all of the dark web is used for illicit purposes, but indeed, it is an area for scammers, fraudsters, and other illegal activity to flourish. And throughout recent years, felonious activity here has become more frequent, more severe, and even more creative. The worst corners of the dark web includes forgery and hacking, illegal pornography, and even murder for hire services. And on August 17th, 2007, amongst this dark virtual world, one fateful message appeared in the forums of one of these hidden websites. I'm looking for a partner in crime, the message read. I just got out of prison. Would anyone else like to work with me in the Tokai region? The ominous message's author went by the username Yamashita, which was a pseudonym used for Yami no Shokuan, roughly translating to the job of darkness in English. And the person behind it was a 40-year-old man who went by the name of Kenji Kawagishi. Kenji was not your typical stand-up citizen. Bullied as a child due to his ongoing kidney disease, he became a delinquent in Japan society. And although he eventually settled down with a wife and four children after several minor convictions, he would sadly eventually return to the world of illegal activity. In August of 1999, he began to use the dark web to obtain, open, and sell bank accounts, which could then be used for fraudulent activity. Although this brought in extra cash for the family, his spending habits rapidly outweighed this new stream of income. And by 2002, his apartment was ultimately seized due to tax fraud and missing mortgage repayments. Now, unfortunately, Unfortunately, Kenji was also allegedly abusive towards his family, yet thankfully his wife didn't put up with his bullshit. She and the kids fled for their safety shortly after these signs started to appear, and eventually the two settled for divorce. But Kenji grew exhausted with his life after this, and between the years 2003 and 2007, he was in and out of prison on several convictions of fraud. Despite these charges, he continued to use the dark web after this, and often moved from job to job, which was usually in transportation or commercial security. At the time of posting his message on the dark web, he had just come out of prison on yet again more fraudulent activity, and was now living out of his car in Isai City. And after reaching out into the unknown world of the dark web, three other men responded. Just a heads up, but we're going to exclude one of them, as eventually he bailed out of the scheme and was never involved in this case. However, the other two were far more guilty. Tsukasa Kanda was a 36-year-old with a similarly troubled history to Kenji. Bullied at school and suffering from chronic headaches, he was also abused by his father. And this volatile and deeply harmful environment led Tsukasa to join local gangs and commit minor crimes. However, eventually, in 1989, he graduated from Takasaki Technical High School. He began to use the dark web in 1997, was convicted of fraud, and then found himself a job at the newspaper company Asahi Shimbun. Allegedly, he often got in trouble with his colleagues and his boss, and his take-home salary was so low that he received weekly pocket money from his girlfriend to support him at the time. And so, similar to Kenji, Sakasa was also in debt and was financially desperate. Yoshitomo Hori, a 32-year-old darts player from the same area, also responded to the message. And although he had no prior criminal history, he was over 4 million yen in debt the equivalent of 30,000 US dollars, or 25,000 pounds. Although there were several other replies to the message on the dark web, Kenji selected these two to work with. And just a few days later, on August 21st, 2007, the three met at Yoshitomo's residence. It is here that they began to formulate a devious scheme to make money. All three men were in crippling debt, and blinded by both panic and greed, they simultaneously expressed a cold disregard for the welfare of others. Their drafts contained several plans, which included included pickpocketing, kidnapping, and even a heist against a pachinko parlor, which, by the way, is a type of Japanese casino. The trio tried to conduct one of these plans the next day on August 22nd, and their plan was rather simple. Target a pachinko parlor customer, follow him home, and then abduct him and rob him of his money. However, after tailing his Lexus vehicle, they realized his home was alarmed and he had a dog, and so there was no way they were going to get him. After following another target home the next day, they were very disappointed to realize that he was in a very tight security building. And so, yet again, the heist was called off. The group came closest to making money when they used a stolen credit card to buy a gold necklace at the local Don Quixote. 
But sadly, or rather not sadly, this also failed. By the way, for those who don't know, Don Quixote is an incredible experience to have when visiting Japan. The buildings are usually massive and sells pretty much everything you can think of. And in a good way, I remember being absolutely overwhelmed when I went there. From instant noodles to underpants, frying pans to dog beds, and Pokemon costumes all the way through to, uh, Tenga eggs. Don Quixote has you covered. It's kind of like a multi-level department store cross treasure hunt, and I bet my bottom dollar that you'll be sure to leave with a suitcase worth of stuff. The place sells really cool stuff, and not even sure why, but when I went on Kyoto I bought 10 of these in like 10 different colours. Kinda cool though, right? Anyway. So it appears that our three men were not having any luck with their plans, and with their failure came both frustration and desperation. And tragically, the very next day, and after upping the ante, their devious schemes would come with some very harrowing consequences. August 24th, 2007. It was a Friday, and at 10pm that evening, young office worker Rie Isagai was walking through the streets of Nagoya to return home from her job. The day was long in the tooth, and with it being a Friday, the working week had overstayed its welcome. Rie worked in the office of a semi-local firm. Most of her tasks were administrative, meaning she was not someone particularly high-ranking in the company but was just as essential to keep it ticking along. Trying to find recognition and reward for her hard work, she stayed late to finish her duties that Friday. And by the time she had almost made it home that night, the streets of Kanagawa were dark and silent. But no worries, she only had a few more corners to walk to make it back to her front door. Looking into her past, Rie had always been a hard-working and thoughtful individual. She was born on July 20th, 1976, to her father Suiyoshi and mother Fumiko. Sadly, she was only a child when her father passed away, this tragically leaving both her and her mother to fend for themselves. But through this, the two formed an inseparable bond, and although she dropped out of high school, she impressed her mother by jumping straight into work. To add to this, Rie even held on to the dream of one day buying her mother a house. Rie loved board games. In fact, one of her favourites was called Go, and in her spare time, she often met friends and even made new ones at Go cafes across the city. She was a strong-willed person, yet caring all the same time, and now that she had reached her 30s, she was focused on progressing her career. Which takes us back to the story, to August 24th, 2007. Residing in Komei 2 of Chikusa Ward in Nagoya, Rie used the Higashiyama line to reach her local station at Motoyama. This was part of her usual commute, and once there, she made the one-mile walk back home. It was just past 11pm when she walked past an idle vehicle, and with no reason to be alarmed, she ignored it without giving it any second thought. It was at this moment though that the car made a U-turn and discreetly passed by Rie. Peering up, she noticed a man nervously looking around at the buildings, and as she approached him, he turned around to ask her a question politely. I'm looking for the local convenience store, do you know where I could find it? Rie stopped to answer, However, before she could even answer him, she turned around to see another man lunge at her. And all in the meanwhile, the car she had spotted before had now hastily parked up next to them. Rie screamed out loud, but nobody in the neighbourhood had heard her. And before she even knew it, she was in the back of their vehicle. A vehicle that was now speeding off into the distance. The consequences of that night were discovered the very next day. A body was found around 35 miles northeast of Nagoya, and in the mountains near Mitsunami. It had been partially buried near a bridge from Route 33, and tragically, this body belonged to Rie Esagai. She was discovered by the authorities just after 7pm, meaning she had been missing for just over 20 hours. Despite being concealed in a remote location, she had been discovered very quickly for a very good reason, because the one to break the news would be none other than one of the killers themselves. Earlier that day, the authorities were greeted with a very concerning phone call, and after picking up the phone, the voice said, I kidnapped a woman, I stole her money, killed her, and then buried her in Gifu Prefecture. As you can likely guess, the three men to abduct and kill Rei as the guy were Kenji, Yoshitomo, and Sakasa, and she'd become their first and only victim from the dark web. After abducting Rie and planning to rob her of all her money, they then murdered her in cold blood, before moving 35 miles out of town 
and dumping her body. However, it seems like it didn't take long for Kenji's sanity to break, because by sunrise, he had become extremely paranoid. After making the call, he was detained by seven police officers dispatched from the Midori police station, and after being questioned for 15 minutes, he was taken to the mobile investigations unit before leading officers to the site. Now, Kenji was absolutely terrified of capital punishment. However, under Japanese law, he was not allowed to be executed if he surrendered himself first. And so, after his despicable actions, Kenji was left with two options. Try to evade the law and risk his life, or give up his free life and guarantee survival. Kenji chose the latter, and in addition to this, he even confessed that he had the help of two other accomplices, and even provided both their names and addresses. Yoshitomo and Tsukasa were arrested the very same evening, and just hours later, Rie's body would be formally identified by her mother. Naturally, Fumiko was distraught by the news. Rie was her one and only child, with a father who had died decades before. The entirety of her family had now been lost, and Rie's absence left a massive hole in her heart. She described identifying her daughter's body as an out-of-body experience, and despite her daughter's body's chilling condition, she hugged her tightly through the pain and anguish. Colleagues of Rie were devastated too. They had known her for many years. Not only was she just a colleague, but she was also a friend too. By midnight, the Special Investigations Unit publicly announced Rie Isagai's murder. They further reported that three men had been arrested, and believed that no one else was at risk. Although only one had openly surrendered to the authorities, Kenji, Yoshitomo, and Sakasa all eventually confessed to their crimes. They told investigators that they had met through the dark web, and that the primary motive was greed, to settle their unpaid debts. Furthermore, they also confessed that they were willing to do anything to achieve this, which sadly included murder. The details of this crime are particularly saddening. After being abducted, Rie was handcuffed inside the car and driven to a secluded area. The vehicle used to transport her belonged to Kenji, and had been unlawfully obtained through one of his former fraud schemes through the dark web. Her bag was looted, which at the time contained 62,000 yen, the equivalent of $450 or £380. She was then further pressed to provide her bank card's PIN number, but unknown to all three of them at the time, she had given them a fake one. Shortly after this, Rie was then suffocated and beaten with a hammer approximately 30 times, and eventually, she heartbreakingly succumbed to her brutal injuries. The three assailants then stopped by a hardware store, purchased two shovels, headed out into the mountainous countryside, and at around 4.30am, dumped her body in mid-tsunami. At around 9am that morning, they tried to withdraw money from her bank account using the PIN that Rie had provided them. 2960, or was it 2946? Or 2460? Astoundingly, it seems that remembering four simple digits required far too much intelligence for these three men, as all three of them had forgotten what she had said. Despite already showing incredible levels of stupidity, it takes a special kind of stupid to come to the next conclusion. But since they had failed to make any money this time around, all three agreed to meet again later that evening to find another woman to abduct, rob, and murder. However, as we all know, before they could even get there, Kenji's conscience thankfully got the better of him. Following the loss of her daughter, Fumiko made it her mission to punish her three killers just as hard as they had punished her, and within ten days of Rie's death, she had launched a campaign calling for the death penalty for all three men. By the tenth day, she'd received the support of 100,000 people, by October was 150,000, and by December was 318,000 signatures. Not only that, but incredibly, even Yoshitomo's and Kenji's fathers begged the courts for the death penalty. Although single murders rarely face the death penalty in Japan, this case seemed to drum up a lot of anger in the general public. And not only that, but recent trends showed that people favoured stricter punishments. Initial court proceedings began roughly one year later in September 2008, and in this first session, all three admitted to robbing and murdering Rie. They further admitted that things got out of hand when they tried to live up to their boasting online. This is because all three men had claimed that they'd murdered someone in the past, when, in fact, all three were lying to each other. Defense attorneys argued that Kenji, Tsukasa, and Yoshimoto should not be punished with the death penalty because Rie's death was supposedly accidental. They also argued that, historically speaking, all single murder cases usually result in a life sentence and not the death penalty. Now, all three defendants disputed who was the primary assailant and mastermind behind the murder. Kenji insisted that Tsukasa was to blame, and Yoshitomo followed these allegations. 
But Sakasa blamed Yoshitomo, claiming that he was the first to strike Rie. There were clear differences in attitudes during these discussions. Although all three men seemed unfazed and emotionless over their actions, Sakasa often made fun of Rie throughout court proceedings, where Kenji said that the victim was simply unlucky. But on March 18th, 2009, Judgment Day finally arrived. The district court found all three defendants guilty of all charges, and as a result, Tsukasa and Yoshitomo were sentenced to death for their actions. It was ruled that their motives for the crime left no room for leniency, and that capital punishment was the only option, and Kenji was given a life sentence due to his early surrender. Although Rie's mother and ex-partner were both disappointed at Kenji's life being spared, it was widely recognised that a death sentence for Yoshitomo and Tsukasa was exceptionally strict when compared to similar cases. As expected, all three men appealed to have their sentences reduced, and while Yoshitomo's death sentence would be reduced to a life sentence, Tsukasa accepted his fate and withdrew his appeal. This resulted in both Yoshitomo and Kenji being spared their lives. However, for Tsukasa, that would not be the same and on June 25th, 2015, he was executed via hanging. A sad side note to the story, but unknown to Fumiko at the time, Rie had actually been saving more than half a monthly salary to help buy her mother a new home. At the time of her death, she'd saved up more than 8 million yen, which is the equivalent of $59,000 or £50,000. If it wasn't for their forgetfulness, her assailants may have even got their hands on all that money, but thankfully they were too stupid to remember four digits. Regretfully, I see much familiarity between this case and the story of Eve Carson. Both were bright young women with great prosperity ahead of them, and they were both caught up in their day-to-day -day lives when bad luck and merciless tragedy struck. They were targeted, hunted, robbed, and then murdered. And for what exactly? A few measly hundred dollars? The motive behind their deaths is, quite bluntly, almost entirely incomprehensible. An entire life filled with friends, family, partners, love, hope, friendship and prosperity was ended to temporarily fix the financial burden of an irresponsible, low-life individual. The stark level of selfishness is entirely enraging, and now a mother has lost her one and only child. An array of people have lost a good friend, and a young woman has lost her life. To this day, Fumiko still gives lectures in various schools and places to talk about her daughter's story. She provides insights into keeping people safe on the streets, and even raises awareness of dangerous online behaviour. And that's pretty much where we are today. With Tsukasa dead, both Kenji and Yoshitomo remain alive and behind bars. Forever. And so concludes another video today, folks. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or you learned something new, remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. So what are your thoughts on this case? It's interesting when you think about it, because many people push for the death sentence when, in single murder cases, it usually doesn't happen. So I guess the big question here is, do you think that any or all of them should have been given the death penalty? Or do you think it's right where it stands? Thank you again to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. If you would like to protect your online privacy, then remember that the link is down below. A quick reminder to anyone who would like to support the channel, or for more additional content, I do have a Patreon, which I'll leave in a link down below. And of course, thank you to all you patrons that already exist. And for more random content of myself or Nero, follow my Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Thank you again, folks, for being here, and I'll be back again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.